So Helen Kerbalis, just describe to us what you are right now. What I am right now? <laughs> I, um, so I'm the chair of the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Yes. That's what I am right now. And I'm also a director and film producer of a documentary called A Life of Its Own. So I'm, I'm living in those, um, in those two worlds at the minute. Now, this movie that you've made has a lot of emotion invested in it from you. Yes. I want you to take the emotion out. Okay. And describe what this film is about and what it's for, what you wanted to achieve. Really on a simple uh, level, and if you pair everything back, my original intention was uh, that I wanted people just to be a bit better informed about the subject or a lot better informed about the subject. Um, and... Just to explain in simple terms that there is a science that exists. Uh, there's a science within um, our, our body that exists around um, marijuana um, or cannabis. Uh, and, and really, um, a lot of this um, is hampered by research. Uh, a lot of it's hampered by research and development that comes out of the States. And I think a lot of it challenges the current doctor paradigm that's in place. Plus, of course, there's also the war on drugs. I stayed away uh, from that part of the debate. But in its simplest form, just just a film to educate and better enlighten people about what the topic is and to walk away making up your own mind because that's what I think journalism is all about. Okay. What were the things you want the film to correct? Did you say you wanted to inform mm -hmm. people? To correct. And having seen the film, it is very much a, what I call a corrective documentary. Yeah. It's something that takes something that is largely misunderstood. That's true. And wants to basically inject information, facts, figures, anecdotes, testimonials to inform further debate, discussion, and lawmaking. That's true. And that's why the film was really segmented into the chapters because it, it was to make it really clear to people uh, that this is the debate around schizophrenia. This is the debate around cancer. This is the debate around anecdotal evidence. Uh, this is the debate around research. So that's why it takes, and even, even just the simple explanation of what medicinal cannabis is and where the name marijuana came from and the contentious part around that. But basically a huge exercise in demystifying what has been a largely stigmatized plant. So what's the stigma? Well, the stigma is that we think of it as in demonic terms, that it's linked to, um, inextricably linked to, to psychosis um, and to schizophrenia. Because the, the film very clearly sets out the differences when you get into the chemistry That's and right. the different names of the chemicals uh, involved. I hope you didn't get lost in all of that. <laughs> no, I didn't. Because... I tried to make that super simple. And I had my sister on side who's a scientist. So I asked her to, to think about it, describing it to a lay person, just mm. people that have no knowledge whatsoever. And in the simplest way, helping us to understand how it responds um, to our body and what the compounds in the plant are. Well, I guess one of the interesting carryovers from your TV work is that it does carry over that TV discipline of keeping things clear and simple. I'll get to this point yeah, in a few thanks. moments' yeah. time. but Yeah, that was yeah. intentional. Yeah. And it does have a TV like I, a feel about it. So I think um, some, a filmmaker that I showed early on in the piece said, it's like intimate TV, isn't it? You know, but then, so it's been a surprise mm. really to see a cinematic release, but I'm glad for that. Uh, it was interesting when we first started shooting, we shot on uh, 24 PS, which means that it was shot um, in a film yes. ratio rate. So it was accidental really that it was shot that way, but I still think it's actually translated into a, a kind of, has a cinematic or filmic feel about it uh, in a way too. We'll but a bit of both. Let's you now just inject some of the emotion back in to okay. it because this was motivated yep. by your emotional response to doing a story for Sunday night. Is that true? That's right. So the so first so, time... Just give, give us the, the, the back story. Okay. The back story really simply is that the first time we did the story on, on um, medicinal cannabis, we went to Tamworth and filmed a, a young boy struggling with cancer, final stages of cancer. It was a story that I, I, I thought I knew really walking into it. I thought, okay, um, we all um, have some idea about the pain relieving effects um, about medicinal cannabis. And his and name was... His name was Dan Haslam. And yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful... Guy. Name and that has now become central to absolutely. this discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. And Continue. we became friends and close um, during that time. Uh, but as you know, like a 
when you when you are a journalist, it's always that fine line, isn't it? You know that you tread to stay, try and stay really balanced and a bit objective and quite objective throughout the process. So what happened? It was, it was a bit hard to do that with Dan. It was probably the first time in my career that I found that wow, I've um, I'm on. I'm on the other side now. Not not so much. It didn't influence my – I didn't go, wow, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a medical cannabis activist now. Not at all. But I think Dan was just the person that um, – he had a similar mindset to me, that we thought of it in a similar way, that we associated it with the um, psychosis and schizophrenia links. So for me, I think that his learnings um, paralleled my journey as well, and I guess I was just a bit later in that stage than him. Okay. So, well, in a way, you snapped. Yeah. As a journalist, you actually became emotionally involved. That's true. Uh, and emotionally yeah. moved I by did. a story so much so that you've gone on to make a film. Just tell us a little bit about how you got this film together. Because Helen Kapalos, I would have thought that as one of the great alpha females of Australian <laughs> television, the idea of yeah. making a feature-length documentary of this sort would have been a relatively easy sell to a smart television station. Given the amount of money, for instance, that's been expended on a highly dubious adventure with 60 Minutes, yeah. that a relatively small amount of money for an that's obviously true. worthwhile film would have been an easy task. Well, what you're, happened? Yeah, you're the first person that's gone there because you've obviously got um, you know, uh, knowledge about the TV industry. Okay, so this is this is my honest answer to that. Uh, I was afraid of a couple of things happening. I was afraid of, of maybe doing an easy sell or a pre-sell. If you do a pre-sell in TV, it means that you're forfeiting distribution rights um, and content rights, and it also means that you don't... Um, so so the content can obviously be shaped. Uh, uh, in those early talks with, with one commercial network, they started to give me a very clear indication of what their direction was. It didn't align with mine. It didn't align with the original purpose, and I thought, what's the point of, of doing this? And so the other thing that happens is it's buried at 10.30 on a Sunday morning, and you don't see it. So I never saw it as being something that, look, I thought they're not going to take a documentary from a from a, a female TV presenter and treat it credibly and put it on at 6.30 on a Sunday night. That just won't happen. That's honestly what I thought. Uh, now, that might not be the case, but uh, I guess I had a degree of scepticism about where it might land. And so I thought, look, it's just important. I don't know where it's going to go, uh, but I just know that I've got to take the reins on this. And it, it was a, it became a swan song, really, to my TV career. So you didn't approach any of the TV stations? I didn't approach them, no. I was okay. approached by one. Okay. Yeah. Who was that? Um, can I say I can, it? Well, well it, was, it was Foxtel, yeah. So, okay. And yeah. why didn't you go for the Foxtel? Well, same reason. I just didn't, um, I just didn't see the, the merit in, in, in it going that way. But those early discussions involved content discussions, and yeah. that really concerned me because I thought, look, and it was that whole thing, oh, you're a TV presenter, what would you know? You haven't done documentaries. But I had done documentaries earlier in my career, and I just thought, no, nah, they're not taking it seriously. So I just... I just didn't pursue those conversations. It wasn't a big deal at the time. I just, it was a, a learning. Uh, and there was a few people invested. They they went to um, one person, a producer that I knew, said, oh, why don't I just approach SBS about the topic? And he did on my behalf. And they said, oh, we're not interested in that kind of um, film. So I just didn't take it anywhere. And the whole Channel 7 thing, I... It's bizarre that I didn't pursue them because they've been really supportive. I mean, they've allowed me to use it with the right TV rights, which is a huge thing to do. Uh, so, and yeah, I just, um, it wasn't a conversation that I, I felt I needed to have. I felt that they'd be really supportive of whatever path it took. So you went ahead and decided to make the film. Yep. And you got some money from the bank. Yes. How did you get the money from the bank? Because... My experience of bank managers, Helen Kapolos, is that if you go in there and say, I'd like a loan of $80,000 because I'd like to build a sports bar, you basically have got the money before you've finished the sentence. But if you say, I want to make um, a documentary about medical marijuana, they'd probably be pointing at the door. That's straight. true. Well, that's, so that's, which, which, so which there, was was a little, there was a little white lie involved. Sorry, Bank of Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? But, uh, so yeah, kitchen. Uh, so I just said that I was doing some work around the house, and uh, they were very supportive. And at that time, I still had a you know a, a regular wage coming in, and so um, 
I, I didn't really foresee what was going to happen, which is that I'd leave TV and that I'd be so in, heavily invested in this that I'd actually spend several months unemployed. So really, if, I, if I'd if i known that at the time, I may not have gone down that path, but I'm still glad I did. Okay, again, again, just for the sake of clarity, yep. this project was initiated while you were still at... At Channel, Channel 7, 7 in, okay. in my final months at okay. Channel 7. And you actually got the loan while you were still That's at true. So you still had... For, you still had a for all intents job. and purposes, I had a full time job. Well, and again, just very, very quickly, that's a big gear change for a documentary filmmaker to have to endure to begin a project, secure that you have a full time job, and then as you're getting it done, all that stuff happens, and you end up not. That's true. Yeah. It was an emotional roller coaster, yeah. really. And then leaving was it was a a painful exit really because mm. I knew that I couldn't go back to TV. It was just one of those things. I just thought, look, if, if you know, I, uh, my last year's been spent at Sunday night, that for me was the pinnacle working on a flagship current affairs program. And if I can't um, in, envisage going back to anything that's even, so, so working mm. there was, was wonderful, okay. but I didn't want to keep working there. Uh, and so I, it, it felt like the end. Would you say swan song, you're not going back to that's, TV at all? So that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I guess like for me, that was the pinnacle. And so the last year I thought, look, if I'm not happy with that, because even Sunday night, as wonderful as it was, I still didn't have that control over the content. And that was one of the main reasons that I pursued this documentary. This is what because, I like. this is what we because like. the story was going in a really different and more sensational direction. And I was thinking, what the hell is going on here? It is just going in a really it's not telling the story there's too many chapters missing and so uh, you know maybe it's being in your 40s maybe it's being a journalist for, for that amount of time and thinking is this is, is this where it lands you know uh, and so I thought it was a moment of frustration I thought I just can't do this anymore I really can't I've got to go back to the brand of journalism um, that was there when I began my career which was long form features more investigative and and untainted by all this editorial control so that's um, that that's why I, I took the step I did. So fair to say that your making of the you're making this film was in large part a reaction against the constraints of concision demanded by television journalism. Yes, that was. And how very you, succinctly put, yes. And how do you think the film benefits from that liberation? Well, I I think it benefits from that liberation because it, it's it's a more balanced examination. And even with my personal um, feelings and attachments to it, I still felt that it, it put forward a balanced view. Bill. Well, that was a discipline to stay that, that balanced. It was not easy because I was obviously leaning towards the parents and, lean, and getting attached to those per, personal anecdotes. But it was good having people like my... You know, my sister scientist and then and a number of doctors that were involved to keep me, I, I think, on, on, on a more balanced pathway. Was that second nature to you or did you have to really self-consciously make sure that you got the other side? Uh, no, I guess it was second nature. That's always the brand of, of, of journalism I've liked to invest in uh, over the years. Uh, but I think... Um, it there it was there were some fraught moments there where I wanted to go more the other way and I couldn't. Mm. So the editing process for me was a difficult one in that sense because I had to take out like at one stage it started to just be filled with too many of those stories, and it leaned too heavily um, in favour of them. So yes, are, are we going to describe this film as an activist? documentary? I, I don't think so. Mm. I, I really don't think that it comes across. I think it's a, it's, it's a thinking film, really. I think hopefully uh, you walk away thinking, well, I'd like to know a bit more about it, mm. a bit more why the research hasn't gone as far as it can. And that's why I didn't go into clinical trials and all the politics around it and the debate around whether we use whole plant therapy or not. And I, I just wanted it to be a bit more of a timeless piece in terms of um, just presenting a really simple argument right. about why it, why it could exist and why it doesn't and why it hasn't. Interestingly enough, another motivation for me was watching all the medical marijuana genre films. And there's a huge selection. There's some really famous, fantastic films, but they're just so heavily skewed for it. Mm. And it just, it's not right because there is another side of the debate that we, that it's not properly examined either. And it's important to consider that debate. Well, the scepticism, for instance, over anecdotal information. Absolutely. That's uh, why I put a yeah, question mark next yeah. to that. Now, what life do you want the film to have? Because normally it would 
go out. Well, it's at the Hot Docs yeah, Festival. So I've, Is it getting a regular cinema release? Not that I know, know of, okay. no. I, all along, I've just waited for a platform. So I kept submitting it to the festivals that I thought that would be aligned um, with the kind of film it was. Richard Moore, uh, who you'd be familiar with, um, who has formerly run the Melbourne International Film Festival, um, called me one day out of the blue. In fact, it was Greek Easter at midnight and I was sitting opposite the programming manager of Palace Cinemas. And he said, have you, have you, he's a good friend of mine, Kim Patalis, and he said, have you submitted this to Hot Docs? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, well, you, you better get in there. And at midnight, he submits it. The next morning, Richard Moore calls me and says, I've just seen your film. Can we put it in Hot Docs? And so it was really it was serendipitous the way that all happened and unfolded but I'd still had it in a number submitted in a few festivals but the right ones and I was waiting for the right platform and really to answer your question about distribution I've just always felt that it would mirror the title it would hopefully have a life of its own with distribution more organic it's about getting it to the right audiences so it might even be that people host their own screenings or that it goes into regional areas mm-hmm. or something slow, I think, and, and a more staggered release is how I would like to see it go rather than selling it to iTunes or Netflix. Now, now why are you resistant to that? Because this is something that because of, I, have a lot, I have a lot of young filmmakers in here yeah. talking about distribution models and for them that's, in some regards, it's a great option for them because they have no other option and because it's it's less obviously less expensive and less time-consuming and less risky than a cinema release. Why are you resistant to Netflix, iTunes, etc.? I think the fact that it got into a festival uh, to me shows that there's a valid pathway there and I don't want to sell out right now. I really don't. I, I've never been motivated um, to do the documentary for that reason uh, and even if it didn't make any money, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't concern me. What would... What I really want to see happen is for just for it to get in front of as many people as possible. And I'm really enthused about the idea about regional kind of screenings and those areas, the hard to reach areas yep. that, that could benefit because they're the areas that are the ones that have to um, or or I guess are more pressured um, to obtain cannabis from a black market as well or an unregulated market, particularly around Australia. Mm-hmm. The big thing about this too is that people seem to think, oh, it's legal, it's legalised here and, and uh, you know, um, we just have to wait for a few regulations under the federal, uh, under the Commonwealth law and, and it will be passed through, but that's not the case. And are you in debt over this film? Yes, I am. I am. Probably yeah. around $200,000 in debt. Um, but um, I'll, I'm putting a tax, um, you know, my taxation in soon, and I think hopefully I can get something back from that. So mm-hmm. we'll see. And I think there's also, if you're trying to market the film, you can apply for grants and so on. So I, it's, uh, it really doesn't bother me. I don't know why, but I think just leaving TV, I just felt lighter, happier. Life was simpler. I didn't need as much wardrobe or hair or makeup still a little bit with this job but not so much you know and it just everything the load lightened and it's about yeah it was about the original purpose for becoming a journalist to give others a voice that don't have a voice yeah so I, I, I've taken that off the table really uh, so what happens happens there but if I'd be so happy if it gets to international audiences and to audiences around Australia so you've put your money where your mouth is yeah well, I, I believe I have, done. yes. Uh, no one else owns it. Uh, well, there was 10000 raised in crowdfunding and there was some money from another crowdfunding platform, which will go back to the families if that money's made. So. Now, the, the argument that you present and this, the, um, the facts and figures you present in this are quite compelling. You've been a journalist for how long now? 24 years. Do you ever kind of get kind of a little bit like sick and frustrated about how long it takes for things to happen in this country. I mean, we're still talking Abs- about same sex marriage. Yes, it's I 20, do. It's 2016, and we're still talking about this. Well, it's One funny. More. Alex Wadak, who's the Australian head of um, drug reform, said to me, you know, in 10 years' time, your film will be seen as conservative. And I said, really? Do you think so? Because, you know, let's, I said, look at two years ago, you were all saying to me, hurry up, hurry up, get it on air, get it finished, get it in front of audiences. And it was ready a, a year before it even was uh, ready to go to a, a film festival. But I, I guess I took my time, as I explained before, to get the right platform. And also I took my time because I knew not much would happen, even when it started going through federal parliament and, and we started seeing amendments to, to the Drug Act and so on. 
I thought, you know what, it's going to be a long time before we have the same kind of model that Israel has where it's federally regulated yeah. and that they, they treat symptoms, not the diagnosis. So that means things like post-traumatic stress disorder, um, multiple sclerosis. One of the most compelling examples is a lady in the film that has progressive multiple sclerosis who was suicidal. I wish I could have shown her whole story. And mm. what I'll end up doing is cutting little bits and showing them so people... There's a lot of things that were obviously on the cutting room floor uh, and all of those stories will become available, I think, over the next few months. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to your next film. You have something Thank else you. planned? Not yet, no. I, I definitely know with the next film it won't be self-funded, though. So Okay, I've yeah. been... Uh, just- too rough a, a trot for you. I think so. In yeah. the end, it was. I mean, look, it's still been a really worthwhile journey, and I'm really happy that it's turned out this way. But I think next time, and I guess what I mean by that is that it'd be great to have an actual team because yeah. I had to work around the clock to get this finished. Mm. Uh, and I was so, so wedded to it that you know, I had to really force myself to to, to pull so, back at so times. So you're hiring editors, you're hiring sound mixers, you're hiring all those people. To do that stuff, it's a big gig. It is, isn't it? Gosh. Much bigger than I could have ever anticipated. But I made it, right? So I've survived. But, and hopefully people again. enjoy it. So.